as we now prepare our hearts to receive God's word. And let us pray that the Lord will bless our time together around the word. In these days, I must say, a burden like never before has come upon us. To see men who are lovers of God's word, rising up to explain the word of God thoroughly and precisely, firmly, unashamedly, boldly, because there are too many preachers who go up the pulpit almost all the time talking things that are not really biblical. Thinking about, talking about things that are worldly, what the worldly scholars would say. And they take great pleasure in citing men, renowned men of universities and business world and political world and so on. And they like to start the messages with stories. You know, as the Bible has no stories and they are not effective. They tell stories half of the sermon. And they, they preach like men without any authority. We are taught in the Bible to preach with all authority. And make no apology in preaching. And I say these words because we have our team of preachers from different parts of the world in our midst. Who are engaged in raising up preachers in our Gethsemane Bible Institute. Well, we don't have many pre uh, preacher boys, if I should say, uh, in those bi Bible institutes. We just began our ministry. But we are not busy, as Reverend Ephraim said yesterday, inviting all sorts of people to come in because there are a lot of deceivers, the, the, a lot of unholy and unfaithful men who try to come into the church to make money for themselves. They are not given to teaching God's word. They are given to feed their own stomach and sensual passions. Uh, we don't want to train such men. God is in the business of raising preachers in God's kingdom. You know, there is another reason why I'm saying it, because we are now looking to Acts chapter 13 today. Acts chapter 13 is the first recorded message of Apostle Paul. Well, I'm not saying this is the first message he preached, but the message of Paul that was first recorded is seen in Acts chapter 13. You, if you look at uh, Acts chapter 13, you will be able to recognize Paul is the one who is preaching here. Let me take your attention there. Please turn to Acts 13. <clears throat> and if you look at verse 13, Acts 13, verse 13, it says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, that means the Old Testament, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And now watch this. Then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand, said, Men of Israel, ye that fear God, give audience. And then he went on preaching. So we are going to look at a portion of the scripture, which is the first recorded message of Paul in all of the Bible. And this was an amazing providence of God at work. I can't help say a few things about it. First of all, Apostle Paul was a persecutor of the church. He hated the preaching of the gospel. He wanted to destroy the churches. He purposely went about looking for occasions to persecute Christians and even to kill them. He was a violent man. He was a man filled with hatred toward Christian faith. He hated Jesus. Anybody who would say, I'm a believer, would surely feel the wrath of 
This man then called Saul, S-A-U-L. Later on he was known as Paul. We call him Apostle Paul because he was sent by God later to be the preacher of God's word. <clears throat> but Jesus confronted him. Which Jesus? The risen Lord. Jesus who, whom he hated was no more in the grave. <clears throat> he wouldn't accept that. He hated anybody preaching about the risen Lord. That's why he went about pre I mean, persecuting people. One day as he was traveling toward the city of Damascus, with the authority he received from the rulers, to mark out Christians and make their life difficult, <coughs> the Bible says Jesus appeared to him. Right at the gate of Damascus. Confronted him. At that moment, Saul became blind. There was a shining light, shining brighter than the sun, the midday sun. He became blind and he fell on the ground. <coughs> and Saul asked, Lord, Lord, who art thou? <laughs> the answer was, I am the Lord whom thou persecutest. You persecute the church, you persecute me. That's my church. The church is mine. It's my house. It's my people. I'm the head of the house. The church is my body. You kick my body, I feel it. So I'm here to confront you. And that moment, this hate, man full of hatred and anger and deadly intentions was humbled and he realized the one whom he hated is really living as the risen savior and the Lord told him to go and wait until a man whom God would appoint namely Ananias would meet him he went and prayed and Ananias prayed the Lord strengthened him and told him that he is going to be a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ even before the kings. And that is the story of this soul who became Paul, the great preacher. And I pray that the Lord would raise many preachers like this in our church. I know the Lord is doing that good work in our midst. <coughs> but let every preacher remember this. You are serving a risen Lord and he is with you. And the reason why he called you is to change you like the way he changed Saul. Like the way he changed many others to become great preachers of God's word. We don't want anything less than that. We don't settle it for anything less than that. We want to be the preachers of God's word. Every occasion that the Lord would give when somebody says to us, here is time for you to preach, we would gladly rise up and beckon them with our hands. Listen to me. I got a great message to tell you about Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul here preached to a group of Jews who gathered in a synagogue. A synagogue is a place where religious Jews would come together to discuss the matters concerning the Bible. And then Paul expounded to them that Jesus Christ is God's Messiah. Because in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, God predicted that he will send the Savior. And he would die for us. And he would not only die as God's proof that this man whom God sent, who is God-man, God's son who became man, is truly God's son, by his resurrection. Resurrection going, is going to be the seal. The proof. The, the authentic mark. That Jesus Christ is truly the divine savior. That's why resurrection is such a great thing. You see if Jesus is not risen. Our preaching is in vain. Because a dead person cannot save people. A dead person cannot guide people. Our preaching is powerful because we preach the risen one, the living Savior. And so I pray that God will give me the joy of presenting Christ in clarity. And so should every preacher. So my brethren, when you go back 
May you go with the joy that the Lord is risen and he is with you. And preach him without any shame as you did in the past. But seek more strength to be wonderful preachers. We don't want anything else. We don't want to be known as great administrators. We don't want to be known as great marketeers. We don't want to be known as great performers or entertainers or popular politicians. We just want to be known as preachers and preachers and preachers. And so go everywhere. And may God raise up many more preachers in this congregation. May God call many more youths to preach. You know, the other day I was talking about it to a young man. I call him professor sometimes. And he said, no, pastor, I'm not going to be a professor. Then I said, yeah, maybe you won't become a professor in the university. But maybe you may become a professor of the Bible. And I was watching what's his response. And then he smiled and said, maybe. And I was happy. Because if the Lord would call him and if he become a professor of the Bible, to teach the Bible and preach the Bible, that's the greatest joy we can have. May God raise many young men for his name's sake. Now let's see how Paul preached. That Jesus is risen to the Jews. Starting with verse 29 of Acts 13. <clears throat> and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him. They took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And that's my title today. God raised him from the dead. You know, before the resurrection, the Jews were very worried. The leaders of the Jews were very worried that somebody will steal Jesus' body and then go around and tell others that he is risen. Now, why were they so worried? Why were they so worried? Because even before Jesus died, he very clearly and emphatically, repeatedly said, in three days, I'll be risen. I have the power to give my life and to take my life, he said. He clearly said that. He told the Jews, destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. In fact, when he said that, they twisted the story. He said to the, uh, to, to, uh, to the ruler, look, he said he's going to destroy our temple. And within three days, he will raise up. How can he threaten people like this? Jesus never talked about the temple, the structure of the temple. He was talking about his body. But very clear, if you look at the grammatical construction, there Jesus was referring to his own body. This temple. But they twisted the story. They knew it meant resurrection. But on purpose. They twisted to make him look like a wicked man. Who has terrorist ideology. So they want to make the meek Lord Jesus look like a terrorist. So they can put him on the cross. They succeeded it. But even though they think that they have put him in the grave. You know. They knew what Jesus said. But they didn't believe. They thought Jesus will have a cunning mind like this. And Jesus will instruct his disciples to steal the body. So that he may look like risen. So what did they do? They went to the Roman governor, Pilate. And requested for the very well trained soldiers to guard the grave. So there you have, according to the biblical stories, Roman soldiers, well-trained, tough, rough, rugged men, guarding the mouth of the cave where the Lord was placed. The sepulcher of Christ was not only sealed with a hard rock, it had the stamp of the Roman government, and out there, soldiers guarding it. Trying to prevent any man from stealing it. 
But the Bible says, man in his own, po own power, with all his power, guarded the mouth of the grave to prevent Jesus from coming out. But God raised him up. Let's rejoice in this great truth. Nobody controls the history of the world like God does. Nobody controls the events of the world like God does. He is a risen Savior. And He tells us, God in heaven does all things exactly as He planned. No matter who puts the stone in the path to block the path, God will through it, around it, march to his intended purpose. Obstacles are nothing. And now Apostle Paul knows it. Because he was an obstruction. He was an op oppressor. He was a persecutor of the church. He wanted to block the path of the church of Jesus Christ. He wanted to persecute them. He wanted to kill them. He wanted to eradicate the church. But he himself become a preacher. You know, I, sometimes I pray this. If anyone here is really dis disinterested in the gospel, you, you are here to listen and then make funny comments about Christians and laugh at them and joke, joke about them. I pray that as the Lord now comes, he will take you in his hand and you also become part of us. Like Apostle Paul was converted. That all your wicked intentions may be suppressed by the power of Christ today. That your unbelief may be rebuked and crushed. Your resistance may be put down. And Christ may prove to you that he is the conqueror through the preaching of his word that he is risen. Try, try as hard as you can. You will only find yourself being by the wisdom and power of God then the church will march on gates of hell cannot conquer the church Jesus said it and dear friends God raised Jesus against all the obstacles that the world has placed they try so hard to prevent Jesus from coming out of the grave now not only man tried, Satan tried. He also defeated. Satan plotted this. God allowed it, of course. God said, you want to try? Try then. As hard as you can, you try. So, being filled with the devil, Judas, betrayed Christ being filled with the devil the leaders of the Jews and the Romans killed Jesus under the guidance of the demonic spirit they kept him in the grave the dark sullen death and its darkness covered Christ but well, only for three days nothing more corruption didn't set in his body did not suffer corruption. The Lord came out bodily. The body was no more there. He was risen bodily. It's not just his spirit come out. His body came out. The only thing left in that grave was the grave clothes and nothing else. And that's how the Lord risen. Now, is this a myth? No, we don't preach myths. We preach historical facts. We preach realities. We preach things that make sense, which is the wisdom of God. It is not only established by God's wisdom, but also by the evidences, infallible proofs that God gives to us. Let's take a look. This is how Paul preached, how God has risen, God has raised Jesus from the dead and how it is proven. Verse 31, he cites the first proof <clears throat> in this manner. And he was seen 
many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses unto the people. Now I want you to take note the last phrase at this point of time. His witnesses unto the people. Whose witnesses? God's witnesses. Because God is the one who raised Jesus. And when God raised Jesus, it was not just a voice that says he is risen. It was not some mystic notion or idea or dream. God appointed certain men to meet the risen Lord and converse with him, interact with him, and then go and tell others. That's what a witness is all about, is it? isn't it? A witness has to have some experience of something in order that he may give witness to it. Otherwise you can't call him witness. The idea of witness is that you see it and then you stand up for what you have seen even if it means you have to give your life. That's why the word witness in the Bible has this Greek origin of martyreo, martyr. A witness is a martyr because he stands up for what he believes to be true. He's willing to give his life. If you go to the court and be a witness, you better understand this. You better stand up for what you say. If you told a lie in the court, you will have very severe punishment. So you've got to live for what you say. A witness is like that. There is no ambiguity in his heart. He's certain. He's sure. He means what he says. Not like some Christians whom I am quite hesitant to call Christians. If you are a Christian, you must be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, every Christian is God-appointed witness to Christ on this earth. May I pray at this moment that our church, all of us, not only the preachers of this church, not only the elders and deacons, but every member of this church and every true Christian everywhere will be a witness to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Our life has to testify. Our mouth has to confess. As Apostle Paul later on said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We live for Christ. We live for no other purpose. Christians, you are not living for money. Yes, we need to have money in order to feed our families and to support the church and to give for good cause. But that's only because God allows us and we want to do that in a way that will glorify Christ and witness Christ. We are not here for any other pursuit. Our ultimate purpose is to be witnesses. Now watch this. Here the Bible says, the risen Christ had God appointed witnesses unto the people. And how are these witnesses explained? In verse 31 we are told that Jesus was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. You know, there were a group of people who traveled with Jesus to Jerusalem. Um, if you know the historical background of the gospel story, that Jesus was in the northern part of Israel called Galilee. He came down to Jerusalem for the last time. And he very clearly told his disciples that once he entered Jerusalem, he will be caught persecuted and killed. He said that. And he said that because when he comes to Jerusalem, the first reaction will be like no other before. The people will be waiting at the gate, not to kill him. When, when he arrives at Jerusalem gate, people will be waiting there with branches of the tree, throwing the clothes in the hand. Hosanna! Blessed is a man who cometh in the name of the Lord. They welcome him like a king. Jesus knew that's going to happen, so he didn't want his disciples to think that he is going to be a real king, but he wanted them to know, I will be persecuted as soon as I enter. 
This reception by a group of believing people does not mean I will be received. There is hatred behind that joy. Jesus knew it. He predicted it. So he entered the city on the top of a donkey like a humble king. He didn't want to totally reject the love and passion of the believing ones. He accepted it. He ended according to their expectation, not as a king riding on a white horse to rule politically, but as a humble savior, the king of kings on a donkey. He ended. And then the, some Jews who were full of hatred told them to shut up. Don't praise Jesus like this. And they complained to Jesus about it. Jesus said, if you stop them, I will bring praise out of the babes and sucklings. I deserve that praise. But dear friends, soon he was taken. Just as he predicted. So there was a group of people all the way from the north of Israel, Galilee, to Jerusalem. They followed him. They were part of that great procession which we call the triumphant entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And they followed him while he was taken, while he was cross-examined, while he was humiliated, while he was made to carry the cross and climb the Golgotha hill. They watch, these people watch Christ dying a cruel death. Their hearts were sad. All of a sudden, the one whom they have admired, one whom they have visioned as the great king of the world, the great king of the Jews, was cruelly mocked. They placed a crown of thorn on his head to mock him. They put a purple robe first, slap his face, then remove all his clothes. Whip him with whips. Then nail him into the cross. And all these sights were so confusing to the hearts of the poor people. They were troubled. But they kept remembering what the Lord said. So I believe in this big group of people who followed Jesus from north, northern part of Israel, Galilee, down to Jerusalem and witnessed all these cruel afflictions Jesus suffered in the midst of their adoration and thanksgiving to him were waiting to see whether he will be risen on the third day exactly as he said. And he did. And he did. <coughs> Let's go to the first chapter of this book. <coughs> first chapter of this book. Acts chapter 1. <coughs> Verse 3, to whom, well the word whom refers to the apostles, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. You notice that? So the, to the apostles, to his disciples, he showed himself alive after his passion. That means his suffering and death. By many infallible proofs. Many Evidences to show that he is alive. You know, he ate with them to prove that he is not a ghost, his real risen savior. He told Thomas, who was unbelieving, he said, Unless I put my finger in his wounds, I won't believe. Jesus appeared to him and said, Here, come. You put your finger in my nail prints. <laughs> Thomas didn't have to, the sight of that nail print, make him cry, my Lord and my God. He worshipped the Lord. And there were so many such proofs, many infallible, unmistakable, cannot be proven wrong facts. And then how long did Jesus appear after his resurrection? In the middle of verse 3 of chapter 1. Being seen of them 40 days. For 40 continuous days, the Lord continued to prove himself to be risen from the dead. 
And not only he appeared to show, he also spoke. He continued to teach them. You know, they have been with Christ for three years. They knew how Jesus spoke. They knew how clear he speaks. His teaching is so fabulous, so authoritative, so clear, so accurate. There was none like him. And when Jesus risen again and started to teach them, they could recognize, this is my Lord. Yesterday during the dinner, you know, we have 400 old people there. I move about from table to table to greet people. <clears throat> And when I came across one table, I saw a lady whom I didn't greet that day. <clears throat> so I was glad she's there and wanted to greet. And then I said to her, Sister, I didn't greet you yet. Where have you been? Pastor, I know you are coming. I said, How do you know? I heard your voice. You see, she's familiar with my voice. She has been hearing this poor preacher screaming every Sunday. So she, <laughs> even if I, I'm losing my voice, I think many of you can recognize. You know, even our children... The babies here can recognize my voice. <laughs> I, I have many infallible proof about it. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you, you, if you are familiar with a man whom you follow, and you don't listen to me every day, well, I know some of you will download my uh, messages on the internet and listen to it every day, but some of you don't, but still you recognize, right? A mother recognizes a child. A child recognized a mother's voice. How can these disciples ever be confused about the Savior who came to teach them? Cannot. They were infallible proofs. He not only proved by his deeds, by his manifestation, and even showing his wounds, and then also even more clearly, I believe, by his teaching. Because every time when Jesus taught, he taught based on what God has already revealed. He never contradicted the Bible. He always expounded the Bible and make it applicable to himself. Because the Bible is all about him. He proved himself to be the Messiah through his teaching. And so there was a clear proof. Now please turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul later on told the Corinthians about it. Let's have a quick look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> now, verse 4. <clears throat> and that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So it is already predicted. And then Paul goes on to say that there, was, there were many witnesses. And listen what he said in verse 5. Listen to this. And that he was seen of Cephas then of, and then of the twelve. You see, Cephas is Peter. Cephas so Peter had several names, Cephas, Simon, and Peter. And Cephas was, uh, sorry, Cephas saw Jesus Christ, and then the twelve. Right, so that's very clear. Now, by the way, who is this twelve? Who is this twelve? Judas Iscariot is dead, you know. He died before Jesus resurrected. So who is this 12? Not Paul. Paul was a persecutor at that time. It is Matthias who took Judas' place. All right? So I always believe Paul didn't replace Judas. Paul was a special apostle called to the Gentiles. The apostolic witness in the Bible is that Peter and the eleven. Peter, including the eleven, makes the twelve. So those who saw G risen Christ included Matthias. And there you have. Now verse 6. More witnesses. After that, he was seen of, the, of about 500 brethren at once. One time, 500 
believers saw him. More than 500. And then he goes on to say, Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So while Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he knew some of the witnesses died since then, but some still live. And Paul says, I know of the 500 and more. Then he again says in verse 7, of more witnesses of Christ. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And the last of all, he says, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. That's why I say Apostle Paul is not among the twelve. He is born out of due time as a special apostle. As though he came late than expected. Now the very clear, the scripture says, for 40 days, Jesus <coughs> appeared as a risen Lord. And then told those who saw Christ to go around and tell others. They were witnesses of God unto the resurrection of Christ. So that's the first evidence Paul gave to this group of Jews in the synagogue. And then we come back to chapter 13 of Acts to continue with the rest. Let's uh, pay attention to these facts. Now verse 33. I'm sorry. I jumped too, much, too many verses there. Verse 32. And we declare unto you glad tidings. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers. So here Paul says. Because Jesus. Uh, because God has made us witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, we declare unto you glad tidings. This is a joyous message that we preach. That Jesus is risen. You know, it gives hope to those who are in fear of sin and death and punishment. It gives us renewed life to those who are lost in sin. How wonderful it is to see so many of our brethren here from the care ministry, for instance. But I'm not classifying them as, as the only sinners. I think I, I'm worse than them. I don't want anyone to even know the kind of sins that plague me. It's shameful to say anywhere, anytime. But unfortunately, because of the circumstances, some, some people's sin become too obvious. You know, let me be very frank with you. Do not ever think those in the prison are the only criminals in this world. Many criminals are sitting in police stations and in the courts of this world. There are many wicked men in all these places condemning others. Where they should be the first one should go in. But for some reason their sins are never known. Okay, so when I mention our brothers in care ministry, I'm not looking down as though they are the worst in the world. No, they would like to say we are the worst. But I would say, no, you know about, I'm the worst. <laughs> Don't take my place. I mean, even Apostle Paul said that he is the chief of all sinners. We all want to be in that list because we are. We are. Now, the reason why I cited them is that they were lost in drug addiction. They were put in prison. Not once, twice. There are those who were here more than two, three times. The parents couldn't change them. But the risen Lord changed them. And we are glad. In this regard, we have Brother Linus and David and Jimmy all to be baptized. And receive into our membership. And how wonderful it is. They are witnesses. And we have a wonderful message. That's why now we just started our prison ministry. Thank God for Brother Jeremiah, Preacher uh, Daniel Lim and uh, Preacher Kelvin who are going in. And I want to go in also to preach to them. Because the power of the Lord Jesus is good news. Good news to those who admit their weaknesses. Those who really realize how terribly lost they are. The entire humanity is lost. There is only one power 
renewing power, transforming power, saving, redeeming, forgiving power. That's the message that Jesus is risen to take away our sin. And this church stands for that truth. We stand to follow the risen Savior. We stand to preach that Savior. And we bring glad tidings. Let's not ever be ashamed to talk about Jesus. He is risen. So we continue with that verse. We declare unto you glad tidings. Verse 32. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers. Now here comes the second proof of Christ's resurrection. He says, when we bring these glad tidings to you, let me tell you, this is not something new. It has been there all through the history because God has been talking about this, that he will send his son to die for sinners and he will raise him up. Now there are people who say, oh, the Old Testament people didn't understand this because they never heard about Jesus. Who told you that? It is not in the Bible. That's your notion. That's a, uh, a group of uninformed Christians who are not instructed in the truth of God's word. I want to rebuke such Christians. Stop talking nonsense that the Old Testament saints didn't know that there will be a savior. That they, they didn't know that he would die and resurrect. There is no other name that can save man since the fall of Adam. There is no other savior for them. The gods and bulls they sacrifice, the doves they sacrifice could not save them. It is the Lord Jesus. You know, then you may ask, but Jesus was not there yet. He didn't die yet. It is not that he was not there yet. The fact was he was preached then. They believed. What did they believe? That Jesus will come and die for them. They believed the truth that God proclaimed. Just as I preach to you today, you believe. Jesus is not here now. But is physically he may not be here now. He is living to work in your heart. He is the God of all the earth. There is no other Savior. He is the Savior of the world. Not that everybody will be saved. But if the world has to have a Savior, there is only one. No matter what corner you live, no matter in what time period you live, there is only one Savior in all ages, in all the world. And that is the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul said to the Jews who were sitting in the corner of the synagogue, Now wake up, my dear friends. You don't doubt about Jesus. You heard about Jesus. But let me tell you, it's not a new story. It has been written in the scriptures. Our fathers believed. Why are you waiting? Wake up and believe. This has been an age old truth. It's a gospel from the past. Many have believed. And how did he prove this? How can you prove that the resurrection of Christ was a settled fact in the hearts of the believers of the past? Look at it. He proves it this way. Verse 33. God had fulfilled the same unto us, their children. You know, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. What does that mean? What God has promised our fathers is now fulfilled before our eyes. You know, he was telling, Paul was telling his contemporaries, we are very fortunate. Our fathers waited in the anticipation of faith to see Jesus coming and dying and resurrecting. They died without seeing, but they believed, so they are saved. Now we have the opportunity to see this all and hear this all in our time and to have these witnesses preach those things to us. We have the same fulfilled unto us, and we are their children. You know, just a word. To young people who are growing here. I'm so glad you sing in the children's choir and youth choir and so on. But there is a great burden in my heart in these days that you will not believe your fathers who brought you to church. You will not believe the great change God is doing in the life of your parents. Now my dear friends, I do know that some of our parents are not the perfect parents. They made terrible sins. Or they, may commit, they, they might have committed terrible sins even after becoming Christians. They are repentful. 
They are sorry for their horrible disobedience to the Lord. And you might have been offended by their arrogant ways, their disobedient ways. But look, the Lord is chastising them. The Lord is turning them. The Lord is keeping them to Christ. And I want you to remember, this whole process of salvation and securing a people for God for all eternity is a battle. It's a battle against the devil and his kingdom. It's a battle against all the ploys of the world. It will have to put down the fiery dart sent by the devil. And some of our dear brethren may get hit. Some may be taken in sexual temptation. Some may be taken down by covetousness. Some may be trapped in this and that. And your faith may be frustrated. But my dear friends, know one thing. It is Christ who saved your parents. It is Christ who gave them hope. It is Christ and his truth that brought you here through them. And we are their children. And I'm glad that I have godly parents. I'm glad that I have godly Christian grandparents. And I'm thankful that they brought me to church. In the beginning, I was doubtful. I was quite cynical about the faith. I thought I'm smarter than them. I am not. How can I be? I'm their children. I inherit their weaknesses and sin as well. I am as wicked as Adam has, was since the day he sinned. I'm as wicked or even more wicked than my grandfather. It takes some time to understand. Some young children, when they grow up, they think they are smarter than their parents because now they, can, they know rocket science. So they think they are wiser, they are cleverer, they, they can argue God down and talk to the parents about God as not true. <laughs> Don't be foolish! We are all sinners, no matter what age we live. It is the grace of God that proves the word to us. What the ancients have believed have come to pass. And see how God, uh, the Lord tells us this great truth. Second half of verse 13. In that he had raised up Jesus again. How did he fulfill? By raising Jesus again. And he goes on to say, As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. No, Psalm 2 is a David psalm. Now you may want to quickly refer to it. I don't have the time to explain all the matters here, but just a reference quickly. Psalm chapter 2. God willing, another occasion. We have a baptism today, Holy Communion. So very quick reference to these things. Psalm 2. <clears throat> it's a messianic psalm. David the king wrote this. But he wrote about a greater king than himself. That's his own son. His great son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Psalm 2. Um, you see, it's a kingly psalm. It's a messianic psalm. And when you come to verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee hidden for thy inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now this is a very great gospel passage. The Lord says, I have set my king upon my holy hill, Zion. That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is marked out for Christ. Muslims may be there. The Jews may be there. Ultimately, it's Jesus' own earthly throne, Jerusalem. Christ is coming to sit there. But how do you know Christ will come? If he is dead, if he is born here, and he died, if he is buried... Is there a chance for him to be the king which God has appointed to be his place? He only entered Jerusalem on a donkey. He has not conquered, he has not sat on that hill as the king of kings. It is coming. How can that happen? Well, that's why the Lord declared this decree in verse 7. I will declare the decree. What's that? The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
Oh, this is a very important truth. As I said, I don't have all the time to explain the depth of it, but this is one way in which the Lord said, God, the Lord God Almighty, the Father said to his son, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. In a sense, this day have I proven and declared you to be my son. Jesus, God said that when Jesus had his first, uh, his baptism under John the baptizer. Now, Paul, in the Spirit of God, tells us in Acts chapter 13, this was a reference to his resurrection. This verse we just read in Psalm 2, verse 7, is, a refer is with reference to his resurrection. It is a proof that Jesus Christ, resurrection is a proof that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's a divine evidence. Just like on the day of baptism, God gave this voice from heaven. This day have I begotten thee. Just as the baptism was to mark and prove Jesus as God's anointed priest on earth. Here, his resurrection proves that he is our savior. And that's why the next verse in Psalm 2 says, Ask of me and I shall give thee heathen from thine own inheritance. Not only people of the Jews will believe, but even heathen. That's why you and I believe. Indians and Chinese, Filipinos and Koreans, Vietnamese, and all of us. Whether we are Cambodians or uh, Europeans, it doesn't matter. We're Ethiopians, Kenyans, well, may the Lord bring more. You want to go further. Ask of me. I shall give you what? Heathen for thine inheritance. Christ is here to conquer and conquer many more souls from every part of the world. Because he is not dead. He is alive. And God declares by his resurrection. By his resurrection he will save many. And so we pray, Lord, save many more souls. Send preachers. That's why we believe there will be more Pauls to rise up. Many more preachers to rise up. Many more young men to go. We shall not hinder them. But we pray this prayer. Uniting with Christ. Daring to ask for more churches to be established in all the earth. God be merciful to bless us as we join Christ. The risen one in this prayer. Let's get back to Acts 13. Quickly. That's one great evidence. So as the church is being gathered everywhere, let's remember it's a proof of the eternal truth that was declared in Psalm 2. That he's risen, he's risen to conquer the heathen for himself, to make them his church. Right? Now we consider again Acts 13. <clears throat> there are several other prophecies. I will just quickly glance through it. So that we can proceed with our baptism immediately. Now in verse 34 it says as concerning that he raised him up from the dead. Now no more to return to corruption. Now the Bible actually predicted that Jesus will never see corruption. And David said that in Psalm 16. It is cited here in verse 34. He said on this wise I will give you the sure mercies of God. By the way that's a phrase taken from Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah predicted Christ as the sure mercies of David. Sure mercies means the unmistakable grace of God unto our salvation. Jesus' resurrection is for our salvation. And then he goes on to say this in verse 35. This is Psalm 16. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So what Paul is saying is this. In Isaiah 55, by the way, Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant, the death of Christ predicted. And some, in Isaiah 55, you have the prediction uh, that Jesus will come as a savior and he will call many unto salvation. And he is the sure mercies of David. In other words, through David he was promised. Like in Psalm 2, which is David's psalm, Christ is promised. And so he is sure mercies of David. Jesus is the greater David. The son of David. Now why is it said this way? Because Paul is addressing a group of Jews who had great regard for David. They consider David not only as a king but as a great prophet of God. Because many portions of the scripture 
in the Old Testament was give, written by David, like the book of Psalms. There are many Psalms there by David. Now, that, that great truth was controlling Paul's preaching, that this people must hear that David worshipped Jesus Christ, looking forward to him. So when David was here on earth as a great king of Israel, he did not exalt himself about Jesus. That's the point. You see, Paul said a while ago to the Jews, your fathers believed. And I want to tell you, I want to pick up the one whom you admire among the list of your fathers the most, David. And David knew by the prophecies of God that there will be a greater king. And that's Christ who will resurrect, who will save even the heathen through the preaching of the gospel. And his truth was also predicted by Psalm, by David in Psalm 16, as I mentioned, that he will not see corruption. Now verse 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and he was laid into, unto his fathers and so corruption. In other words, he was buried among his father's dead bodies or the grave and he, he saw corruption. In other words, David went the way of man. He died and no more. But David's son didn't go that way. David's son, Jesus Christ, risen again. So he's a great savior. David predicted it and that's what happened. So in verse 37, Paul concluded, He whom God raised again, so no corruption. Jesus Christ is the risen savior. And so he's coming again as we memorize the verse a while ago. Behold, I come quickly. Jesus will come soon to be our savior. And he will save us from our sins today and he will save us from this wicked world once and for all and take us to heaven to be with him forever and ever. And this is a great truth and so we sing praises to him. Now let's turn our hymn to hymn number 215. 